Good morning, you guys, and greetings from Tennessee. Things are beautiful down here. We finally hit a uh, very late fall. It's crisp this morning. It's beautiful. I rolled out, and there was a little frost on the car, and I thought, hmm, guess sometimes over. But it's a good thing. I'm glad to be here with you guys again today. Uh, the other day, I did a video, and one of you guys said, I sure would like to see a video on an Ohio breastplate. And I thought, well, next time I get one, I'll do it. Bought one last weekend at the show in Gettysburg. Man, it was a great show. There was a lot of attendance. Uh, there was a lot of buzz in the room. People were buying and selling and trading. Saw some wonderful things. Talked to some wonderful friends I hadn't seen in a while. And it's always good to go to Gettysburg. If you get a chance, it's a great place. Uh, got to see my buddies at the Horse Soldier up there. Good folks. If you get through there, be sure to stop in their shop. And Brendan sent them in there at Union River Boy. Uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, these two plates. They're very simple. One of them is very simple and very common. The other one is very not. So <clears throat> around 1826, the U S government started using circular plates on cartridge box slings. And normally they'll look like this. They just go on the sling as an ornamentation. Uh, the, during the Civil War, the Confederates liked that big shiny uh, plate right in the middle because it sat in the middle of the soldier's chest. They called it a Yankee bullseye, and it gave them a target to shoot at. So a lot of times that's why you see them discarded, because would you really want to walk around with a target right in the middle of your chest uh, with, with folks shooting at you? I think not. But most all the time, they have an eagle on them like this. This is the standard U.S. Eagle breastplate. Um, neat plate. You can buy them for usually under $200. And you can, a lot of variations, because you can imagine they were arming millions of men and they had a lot of different makers. So you'll see little variations. A lot of people collect those variations. Uh, but the state of Ohio, uh, which was admitted to the Union in 1803, decided they needed their own. And with the regulations of 1859, the state uh, general regulations for military, they uh, used a seal. And it's neat because I didn't realize until I started researching this, that the great seal uh, that we know for the state of Ohio wasn't adopted until 1867. So these were made before that, which helps to explain. Everybody's like, oh, they sent so many soldiers from the state of Ohio. I want to get me an Ohio button. Nope. <laughs> There's a couple out there, but they are rarer than Hensteen. So you don't see many of them. And that's why it wasn't the official state emblem until 1867. But with those 1859 regulations, they used this plate. Check that out. Isn't it cool? It's got a great design. It's one of the prettiest detailed designs that you'll ever see. And uh, it has a wreath around the outside of the whole thing. Uh, and it's got a sheaf of wheat. I always have trouble saying sheaf. Doesn't sound right. They got a bunch of wheat and they've got a canal and a canal boat and a bundle of arrows. And that sheaf of wheat, I said it right that time proud of myself. Uh, that was to represent agriculture, which was so important in Ohio and still is today. Uh, the Buckeye State up there, they had these plates, but most every time that you see them, they're very low units, uh, meaning that they were probably all made pre-Civil War, like a lot of the state seal pieces were, uh, which is why you don't see them in those later war battlefields. You see them during the early campaigns, the uh, Fort Donaldson, uh, where those guys went down. Shiloh, you see them excavated here. Those early battles, because these guys, they used them, uh, they got rid of them because of the target that they caused uh, and for usual wear. So you don't see many of them and you especially don't see them looking like this. You don't see them in that minty kind of condition. And I don't use that word a lot because most of the stuff that I buy, it minty, but this one is. And when you look at the soldier that this is attributed to, it's a soldier in the uh, 67th, uh, or so, I got dyslexic there for a second, in the 76th Ohio, which was a, a early war Ohio unit. The guy enlisted uh, in November of 61 and was discharged for disability in December of 62. So he didn't wear it the whole war. And that explains why it looks like this. And for, uh, he, but he did keep it because 
heat that he wore for a year. <laughs> but it's great shape. It's non-excavated. Most of the ones that you see are excavated and most of the ones you see have had restoration. Uh, and again, about restoration. I never mind restoration as long as I know it and as long as it is priced accordingly. Uh, I had a young man come up to me at the Gettysburg show that has started restoring pieces. And he said, what do you think of this? And and he did a fine job. And I, and I said, well, just be sure that you tell everybody that. And he pulled out a certificate and he does certificates when he restores them. And I thought, man, I wish everybody was that honest, uh, but he did a great job. Uh, but I digress, just have that because you see somebody doing the right thing and you just want to acknowledge them. And that's the way I go. Uh, so back to these, the regular Eagle breastplate by under $200 like this. The Ohio breastplate's gonna cost you thousands if it's really nice because you just don't see them. And uh, they're rarer than a lot of the Confederate buckles. You see a lot more CSA rectangle buckles than you do Ohio breastplates. So what have we learned? We learned that low number Ohio units use these plates. Uh, we learned that they're a lot more rare than Eagle plates. What's another difference on them? If you look on the back of a regular breastplate like this, they have two loops and that loops, but that loops. <laughs> Sorry for all my English teachers that I had early on. Those iron loops were to go through the leather and attach the breastplate to the leather sling. Ohio plates are different. They show up with uh, brass like this. So if you see one with iron, be skittish. Not to say it couldn't happen, but it shouldn't. <laughs> so you wanna see br uh, the brass and you need to be extra, extra, extra careful who you get these from. They have produced a lot of them and there are some amazing fakes out there. Uh, Cause you gotta remember, it's bringing thousands of dollars. It's gonna bring the crooks to the yard. Uh, so stay away uh, unless they will guarantee it. Don't mess with them. Uh, this one's cool. It's as nice as I've ever had. It actually came with this eagle breastplate and this, the, the, sh the shoulder scales that the soldier used. So it's a great piece. You can go to Shiloh Relics. As of the time of this video, it is still uh, available. It ain't gonna last long. Uh, well, I don't think it will last long. I hope it don't last long. So does the banker. So go on there, check it out. Uh, I would, uh, I heard a phrase the other day and I can't get it out of my mind and it's probably going to ruffle some feathers uh, saying it, uh, but I heard them talk on uh, the news uh, when I was riding to Gettysburg and listening to the news and that's always a bad thing because all you hear is bad news, but uh, a man said, you've got to beware of uh, faculty lounge Marxism. And I heard it and I thought, I've never heard those three words put together in that kind of direction. Faculty lounge Marxism. And I thought, wow, that's pretty heavy. Think about it. Faculty lounge Marxism. It's people that have never been in the business world uh, wanting to run business. It's people that, uh, that I really do think most of them mean well. But you have to beware of faculty lounge Marxism because entrepreneurship is what made America the country that it has been for over 250 years. It is what separates us because we are uh, the, the, the country that has developed things and encouraged people to work hard and to work smart. And here lately, we are encouraging them to be dumb to not work hard and to be given things. Those three things are not right. We do not need faculty lounge Marxism or any Marxism. Uh, a friend of mine up there talked about uh, when they asked Ronald Reagan about, and I don't, I won't get it exactly correct, but you'll get to get, you'll get the the gist. I uh, said uh, basically the. People that argue for communism have never been communists. And the best uh, promoter for democracy is somebody that has been a true communist because true communism doesn't work. America is not communist. And hopefully with the help of everybody, it will not. But I digress. I hope you guys are well. Remember to tell those that you love them, that you love them. Be thankful for what you got because we all got a lot more than 
than we probably deserve. We uh, are thankful. And I love you guys, and I'll catch you next time. Have a great day.